Good evening. How many thinks that you endured such a long one this morning? It should be short tonight. I knew, hey, there's a lot who didn't think so. Some spiritual people at Valley View. I'm just glad the rest of you, well, you know what that means. I'm grateful that you're back and that uh, we can do this study. We're going to be in Exodus 3. If you'd make your way there and just leave your Bible open there in Exodus 3, and we're going to be there in just a short time. Byron is here. Let me, what's your last name? Benitez. I'm not even going to attempt your wife's name, but I understand Snow White's okay. To, is that right? Okay. So they, they are here from Guatemala. They do missions there, and we've kind of hooked up with them and done a mission trip two or three years ago. They are here tonight to do a report on what's going on there. Uh, be sure if you there, there's also a, a, a booth out there set up with some information. Even if you cannot go to the meeting, stop by there on your way out and just pick up some, some material if you think you uh, you, you might be interested in reading that and just kind of catch up with what they're doing. I appreciate you being with us tonight and being able to share that stuff with us. Um, Exodus chapter 3. Um, this is a strange passage, but God has this job that he wants Moses to do, and Moses is doing his best uh, to get out of it. He doesn't want to take the job, and you know what you do when you really don't want to do something, but you don't feel like you can say no either, right? You, you, you're put on the spot about something, and you, don't, you, you want to get out of it, but you don't know a good, uh, good thing to do. You, any excuse will do, and you start throwing them out. You start just randomly throwing out some excuses. And the first one is, uh, we looked at last time, was Moses says, well, who am I to do this? You know, it's just not my kind of thing. The second one is tonight. He's going to rattle off several excuses, but we're at number two, and we're beginning at verse 13 that was read just very well a moment ago. One thing that makes this difficult is there's a cultural divide between us and the Israelites. The significance of names is different for us than it was for them. And so Moses said, well, what if I come to the people of Israel? What if I come to these Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What am I going to say? That's the weirdest, weakest excuse I could ever imagine hearing. What is his name? What are you talking about? Now, he's not really asking what his name is. That's what it sounds like to us, and that's what the actual wording is. But for them, the idea of a name is a further revelation of a character. What new revelation does this God have for us? What's he about to do? You may look in the Old Testament, and you'll see this, that every time God did something different, they give him a different name. So there is, there's Abraham when he's offering up Isaac, and God offers up a substitute instead. We're going to name this place, and you can't tell whether it's the place name or God's name. We're going to name him Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And there's a new revelation for Abraham, and he builds his entire life on it. Place names are the same way. Jacob sleeps overnight on a, doesn't have a pillow, so he has a rock and has this dream of a ladder from heaven to earth and he wakes up and says, God's in this place. Let's change it. It's Luz right now, but let's add another name to it. It's Bethel, the house of God. And so every time something happened in a place, they changed the name of that place. Didn't really change it, added to it. And that's why when you look at those old place names of cities there in Palestine, they've got four or five or six or seven names. Every time something new happened, you got a new additional feature to your name. So every time God does something new, the people say, well, what's his name now? What are we going what, what to acknowledge and honor this new thing about God with? That's what they're asking. And that's why when God responds... He says, here's what I'm about to do. And he gives them an itinerary of what God's planning to do because I'm about to reveal myself as something more spectacular than they've ever imagined. The reason I think that is because God does not reveal a new name. And this is what God says, I am who I am. It's the present participle of his name. It's a, I will be who I will be. It's a verb. It's not really a name at all. 
This, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The one who is always present. The one who is continuously present. The one who has no cause. He's always been here, always will be here. God is in creation. God is at the end of time. God is right now. God is 10 minutes ago. God is 10 minutes from now. God just always is. That's all he is. That's who he is. And he reveals himself as he wants to. Whatever he does, he's revealing himself. Why do I think that? A little bit of a lesson of your English, lang your English Bibles. You guys probably have heard this all your life. We call it the tetragrammaton, and that is the four letters that make up the word I am. Y-H-W-H. It's supposed to be Yahweh. I will be who I will be. The Jews were terrified of saying his name wrong when they're going to stand up and do a public reading. And if they accidentally said his name wrong, man, who knows what might happen. So let's, when I see these letters, I'm going to call him Jehovah. That's not what it says, but that's what I'm going to call him. And so when they saw these letters, instead of saying Yahweh, because they might say it wrong, they said Jehovah, and they created a whole new word. Now, what's interesting about our English Bibles is uh, this, um, there's, no, there's no PowerPoint, is there? Well, what? anyway, okay, so here's one word. The word Elohim comes out the word God. You read Genesis 1. God created the heavens and the earth. God said this and this God like this. That's Elohim. It's all over chapter 1. Then there's a name called Yahweh. And when it comes Yahweh, in our English translations, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And when you see that in your English translations, this is Yahweh. This is his name, Lord, all caps. If it's Adonai, my Lord, it's capital L, small O-R-D. All these times you see it in your Bible, it's different. Now, I'm just going to give you an example. Turn to Genesis 18 with me for a second. Genesis 18. Verse 1, and the Lord appeared to him, this is Abraham, a Lord to, appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. Does your Lord in 18.1, is it all caps? It is all caps, isn't it? Now, it might be lowercase caps. Some of them do it that way. It's like capital L and then lowercase caps. If it's all caps, it's Yahweh. It's, I will be what I will be. And that's what Abraham knew God as. Now look at verse 27 of that same chapter. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I've undertaken to speak to the Lord. Is that all caps? No, he uses a different name. It's Adonai here. It's, it's a different understanding. The only reason I'm telling you that is there's a reason why your English Bibles are like that. But I'm telling you that because Yahweh has been known all since creation. He appears in Genesis chapter 2 as Yahweh. So why in Exodus chapter 3 I'm going to reveal a new name? It's Yahweh. Hold it, you've always been known as that. It's no new name. They've been calling him this since Genesis 2. It's not about the name. It's about what God's about to do. I'm about to do something spectacular. And in fact, if you think about the, the moments of the miraculous in the Bible, what miracles appear in Genesis? I mean, you've got creation. That's pretty significant. You've got creation. What else you have in Genesis that is totally miraculous? Anybody? The first book of the Bible that we like to, you know, we, we like Genesis, right? Is there much miraculous there? The flood. That's a miraculous thing. What else? Tower of Babel. Yeah, mix up their language. That all happened in Genesis 6 and then Genesis 10. Creation, Genesis 1. So 1 through 10 or 11. Sarah having a baby at that old age, that must be God, right? But really, I got to tell you, there's not all that much. 
I don't know. I mean, God's doing things and he's leading people, but he's not doing all that much. But God says, you know what? I'm about to do something spectacular. I'm revealing something else about my, I'm the God of Abraham and all the stuff that happened with that. I'm the God of Isaac, all the stuff that happened with that. I'm the God of Jacob. But listen, I'm going to reveal something new. I'm doing something totally new. That was all 400 plus years ago. I've not done anything lately. I'm coming to you and I'm about to reveal something spectacular. I'm going to do wonders people we're going to talk about until cre until the end of time and this is going to be what i'm known for for the rest of history that's why he says the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob has sent me to you this is his name forever and you're going to be remembered for this for all generations and god is when they're about to enter the promised land, 40 years from this time, and the spies go out there and they meet with Rahab and they, she hides them and then brings them out and says, let me tell you why I'm helping you. I know your God. He's the God who got you out of Egypt and crossed you on the Red Sea on dry ground. 40 years later, even the enemies of Israel know their God as the God who worked wonders in Egypt. And we know him as that too, don't we? The rest of time, God says, this event is going to anchor my identity for a lot of people. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to have you uh, do this with me. If you would, if you have your Psalm um, 136 real quick. You don't even really have to turn there because you don't have much of a script, but you're going to say it. Psalm 136. You know these are originally songs. And the chorus is, His steadfast love endures forever. Now your version may something a little, say a little something different, but I'm going to have you say this. I want everybody to say this. You ready? His steadfast love endures forever. Okay, his steadfast love endures forever. How do we know that? My line changes, but your line stays the same. When I point to y'all, you all say, his steadfast love endures forever. I'm going to say my line, I'll point to you. And we're going to go through this psalm real quickly. I'm not going to do all the verses, but several of them. You ready? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and the stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two and made Israel pass through the midst of it. We could go on for a long time, but he says these are the anchor points. This is how you know my love endures forever. From what I do, you know me. And what I'm about to do, he tells Moses, people are going to have a new understanding of who I am. So my name will always be from this point. The God who rescued Israel from Egyptian slavery and set them free. That's what his name is going to be. And so that's what he puts himself as through Moses. He's explaining that God's always going to be who he's going to be. And the way you know who he is, examine what he does. Well, that's interesting. I'm not going to leave it in Exodus. Because many things God has done since then. And if we look into the New Testament for where the I am is, where do we see the I am in the New Testament? It's Jesus. Look at the book of John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Over and over again. And the best one, John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. The best revelation all, the clearest revelation of God is Jesus. And we know him as that. That's how we know this God. He's the same as he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
but we have a closer understanding of who he is because he's revealed himself in layers progressively over history. Our God is not just God. Our God is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. A very specific deity in history. The God of Scripture. This is going to be so incredibly important. And so this is what he says. This is my name forever and thus I'm to be remembered through all generations. Verse 15 of Exodus 3. Sorry, four. No, three. Go and gather the elders together. Here's what you're about to I'm going to tell you what you're to do now. Go gather the elders and say, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, and I've observed you and what has been done to Egypt, he says. And I promise I'm going to bring you up out of those places, and I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 18. They will listen to you. They will listen to you. And the elders shall go with you to Pharaoh, right? And you're going to say, Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us now let us go for a three day trip in the wilderness and I'm going to tell you Moses he's not going to go, he's stubborn he's hard hearted, he's not going to let you go but I'm going to do something I'm telling you right now before you go he's going to say no and he's going to keep saying no but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to do mighty wonders I'm going to do things no one's ever thought or imagined, I'm going to do things that change his mind for a while and, why, and by the way when you leave you're going to do it on their dime because they're going to pay you as you leave. God reveals what he's about to do. I really think what this is what's happening since the first excuse is who am I? The second one is who are you? Moses knows he's about to go among the Israelites and these Israelites don't know him from Adam. <laughs> right? They don't know him. He hasn't worshipped with them. He hasn't been in a worship service with the Israelites. He hasn't hung out in their house. It's been 40 years since, they've ever, since, he, since he was among the Israelites at all. And even then he was a foreigner to them. And yet he's going to waltz into church services and say, Guys, you're supposed to follow me. Your God wants you to follow me. And we're going to get out of this place. And they're all going to look at him and say, Who in the world are you? And he says, they're going to ask me, what do you know about God? And I'm going to go, D -d 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 I don't know anything. So God, I don't know. I, I don't know who I am. You're going to tell me in shortly. But I, I don't know who you are either. It's been 40 years since I've been in a Bible class. I don't know who you are. Who are you? And God goes on to reveal who he is. It's like us saying this. Somebody wants you to do something or say something. And you say, I, I just don't know enough. Have you ever heard that excuse before? I just don't know enough. Who am I is the first one. I just don't feel drawn to this. I don't feel like this is something I can do. And God says, ah, it's good. That's, I'm going to empower you. And the second one is, who are you? I, I don't know enough. And here's how God deals with this. Whether it's trying to reassure the people or whether it's trying to satisfy Moses' feeling of ignorance, the answer is the same. The way God addresses this problem is by giving him revelation. Here's what's about to happen. Here's what I'm going to do. And he knows just enough to make the next step with God and carry out the plan of redemption. He knows what God's about to do and he's going to be able to tell the people. Here's how we solve our problem of using the excuse of I don't know enough. God has given us revelation. We have content for what we believe and it should give us confidence that we can speak it and we can teach it and we can defend it. If you feel like you don't know enough, what are you doing about it? God has done everything he can, including give you a copy of his revelation and saying, here it is. This is my objective revelation. There's no excuse for being ignorant of this. When God calls you to do something, when God's people ask you to teach or to witness in your own setting among people that you know about your faith, do not say, who am I? And do not say, I don't know enough. Ramp up on your revelation. Prepare yourself. Do you know who, who, who uh, learns the most in a Bible class? 
Y'all know this, right? Who learns the most in a Bible class? He's trying to stay one step ahead of the students. One step. I know this because uh, Terry comes in and says, I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. What am I going to do? And he stays one step ahead of you, and that's it. I mean, half a minute. You ask him any question about next week, he won't have a clue because he's got to study before next week. We stay one step. You will sit and be lazy and never grow if you don't challenge yourself to teach sometime. Because the truth is, the revelation that we all need has already been provided. And if we're ignorant, it's because we're choosing to stay ignorant. God says to Moses, I'll address your question by telling you what I'm about to do. And that's all you need to know. And God addresses our issue of ignorance by telling us who he is, what he's done, what he's about to do. You know, church. You know. Don't use ignorance as an excuse not to serve the Lord. He's provided revelation. And that revelation answers every question like, what do I do if I'm, I'm sin, uh, uh, stuck in sin? What if I do if I'm lost? What do I do if I need to know this truth or that truth? It's all in there. And one of those is, there's ever a need that you have, you can always, as one avenue among many, approach the church for prayers. You can come and say, I want to become a Christian and be immersed. These things we know because he's revealed them. That's the only reason we know the answer. Revelation is provided. Don't stay ignorant. Be a person who can go out and do ministry and do things that you're asked because you have what you need to know. That's God's response to Moses. And that's also God's response to you. If you have any need this evening, make it known as we stand and sing to encourage you.